want to begin today uh, by talking about things that we lose all the time. Does anybody ever lose these? Just kind of raise your hand if you're like with me on that, right? I lose my keys at least weekly, multiple times, daily, sometimes multiple times, and it's a big problem. And I know everybody's just thinking, hey, it's very simple. When you come home, you put your key on the key, key chain, and then you know where the key ring is. I don't do that, okay? Sometimes I go back to the backyard to check on the pool. Sometimes I go through the front door. Sometimes We don't have that, and I'm a man, okay? So I'm just, I got all these things going on, and, and it's, a, it's a big problem. How many of you lose this thing? How many lose this thing once or twice a week or once or twice a day? I'll tell you what, the major saver in my life is this watch that is connected to this. I can click it, and I can ping it. Does anybody else do that? Like multiple times, it's like, where's my phone? I don't know. I just, click, I, start, I just go follow the ding until I can find it. My wife, God bless her, is watching right now. I'd like to just give a shout out. Can we just give my wife a round of applause for putting up with me and putting up with our family and all this stuff. She's teaching next week, so if you missed her, she's going to be back. She is one female surrounded by four males, her husband, her two boys that are 18 and 20, and our dog, Simba. And we all lose things all the time. It's just, it's just a thing. And men, men struggle. Maybe this is a, a gender thing. I don't know. But we can't find anything. And Rochelle will be like, let me look for it. And where I spent like 25 minutes looking for my keys, I'm late to a meeting, and she can find it in like 25 seconds. You know, it's just, it's just amazing. She'll, uh, the boys, same way, they've lost their license, their wallets, they've lost their keys. She can find it super quick. Even our dog, you know, just kind of prances around and looks at her, and she's like, your toy is under the couch, just go, and then he just goes and does that, right? You got to have people, she says, she's coined this phrase, I don't know if, the, if you can relate to this or not, but she says, don't be looking with your man eyes. I kind of take the offense to that, you know? Somehow, I'm, but Ed, she's right, you know, so in, in, at least in our house, right? We, we struggle with that. Today, we're going to look at a story where someone was looking in the wrong place, and they needed guidance to look in the right place, and once they found the right place, God got to work exponentially. That's what we're going to talk about. If you have your Bibles, please, 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 please turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. If you don't have your Bible with you, it's okay. It's going to be on the screen behind me or watching online. It's great. Uh, by the way, we have a crazy amount of people who are watching online right now. I forgot. Can we just welcome our online audience? Can we just give a round of applause? Say thank you for watching. We're glad you're with us. It's awesome. The on-air button's on. We're really excited to have you with us. So 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 1. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. I want you to read the words out loud, online, and in person, uh, the words that are underlined and bolded. Ready? In those days, the word of the Lord was rare. There were not many visions. It was a bad time. Uh, God's people had completely strayed from him. And it's not that the word of the Lord was rare. It was no one was listening. And it's the, the, not that there wasn't great things that God wanted to do. It was very simply that no one was listening. No one was paying attention. Maybe better said, no one was even trying to pay attention. In those days, Eli, who was the high priest who was in charge of the temple, his eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see. He was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. Samuel was lying down in the house of the Lord where the ark of God was. So let me give you a little background here. This is the temple. This is where they would go to worship God. The ark of the covenant represents the presence of God. Samuel was this young, young man, young boy, who was there serving Eli, who was the high priest, the lamp of God had not yet gone out, which means that it was way late into the evening, into the wee hours of the morning, 1 a.m., 2 a.m., somewhere in that range. Everybody was pretty much asleep. Samuel was lying down, and then something happened. The Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered and said, here I am, and he, say the next three words with me, and he ran to Eli. Who called? Look on the screen. <laughs> the Lord and yet he ran to the wrong person. It's like getting, you know, a hamburger from McDonald's and not being too pleased with it and going to Pizza Hut to try to get somebody to fix it. The Lord called Samuel, which is also, there's a whole thing I can do on that. Um, he didn't call Eli. He ran to Eli and he said, here I am. You called me. Now we read on. Uh, Eli said, I did not call. Go back, lie down again. So he went and he laid down. Again, the Lord called Samuel, said his name. Samuel got up, ran to Eli and said, here I am. You called me. <laughs> My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lie down. He was an older guy. It was in the middle of the night. You ever have children that, you know, get up in the middle of the night? Some of you can relate to this. And I'm like, uh, she's calling for you, uh, Rochelle. He just said, mom, you go get him. I don't want to deal with this, you know. Now, Samuel did not 
yet know the Lord. He knew who God was, but he was going through all the rituals and all the sit-ups, you know, sit up, stand down, all the, all, the, all the things, but he did not know the Lord. He was just going through the rituals and the motions. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him because he wasn't looking for it. And he was missing abundant life. He was missing God working in and through his life, the creator of the universe, using him to do incredible things. Oftentimes we do that. The location was right. He was at the temple. That's where God's presence was. But the people around him were not right. The high priest and the others, it was a big mess, which I'll talk about in a little bit. And, and as a result, he was really missing. Now, I got this video that was sent to me, uh, I don't know, three or four months ago. It's just a really simple video, but it really speaks to this. It really spoke to me at the time. I want to share it with you. So check this out right now. Good morning, y'all. Have you ever had somebody send you something that was just too good not to share, but maybe a little too much to type? Well, my dad sent me something the other day, and I thought it was awesome, so I was just going to share it with you. If you take this basketball right here, you put it in my hands, yeah, it's worth about 15 bucks. That's it. But you put that basketball in the hands of LeBron James, it's worth about 30 or 40 million. You take this football right here, you put it in my hands, it's worth about, I don't know, 10, 11 dollars, probably. You put it in the hands of Peyton Manning, it's worth about 50, 60 million dollars. Depends on whose hands it is. You take this golf club right here, you put it in my hands, eh, it might be worth 50 bucks, maybe. You put it in the hands of Tiger Woods, though, it's worth 80 million. You see, it depends on whose hands it in. If I have a stick in my hand, a rod in my hand, I might could beat away an animal or a wild animal or something trying to come at me. But you put it in the hands of Moses and it parted the Red Sea. You put a slingshot in my hands. It just becomes a kid's toy. You put it in the hands of King David and he slays the giant with it. See, it depends on whose hand it is in. And, you know, two fishes and five loaves of bread would feed me with some bread left over. You put it in the hands of Jesus, and it feeds thousands. Depends on whose hands that it's in. If I had a couple of nails in my hand right now, I might would build you a birdhouse, if you're lucky. Might nail down a piece of wood. But you put them same nails in Jesus' hands, and it leads to salvation and eternal life for folks who love him and folks who trust him. You see, it depends on whose hands that it's in. And your worries and your cares and the things that's got you stressed out, if you leave them in your hands, that's all they're ever gonna be. But if you put them same worries and cares and your problems in the hands of Christ, he's gonna see you through it. He's gonna take care of every need that we got. Y'all take care and have a blessed day, but just remember, it depends on whose hands that it's in. Give everything you got to God and let him handle it for you. Take care. We love y'all. Isn't that a great video? Depends on whose hands it's in. Depends on whose hands it's in. Samuel was in the wrong hands. His mentor, Eli, refused to discipline his parents. I could do a whole message on permissive parenting, right? But basically what I'll give you the idea he was in charge of God's people. He was in charge of leading God's people to know God. And he let his kids get in and do everything wrong and ruin it for an entire nation because he was unwilling to call them out on their sin. So if that's speaking to anyone here, just let that wash over you. If we're unwilling to lovingly and kindly but firmly call out our kids when they're completely screwing their life up, we failed as parents. That was not in my notes, so I hope I didn't offend anybody by that, but I just felt like that's what I needed to say. So Eli was all screwed up, but he did get it right here at the end. Check out this particular scripture, 1 Samuel chapter 3, verse 9. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. He's like, oh, I, I get what's going on here. So he said to so Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you, say these words. Let's say them together. Ready? One, two, three. Say what's underlined in bold. Ready? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went back, and he lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as as the other time, saying, Samuel, 
Samuel. This time Samuel knew the right place to go and the right place to find the most important person in his life. And he had said, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, see, I'm doing, I'm about to do, I'm, I'm about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears it, say the last word with me, the ears of everyone who hears it tingle, okay? Now, in uh, radio and in TV, the, 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 where they make all their money is the tease right before the commercial. Did you know this? They, they, every note, watch, whenever you listen to the radio or watch TV, there's always a tease right before it goes to the commercial. Why? Because they want you to stay watching through the commercial because that's where they make all their advertising dollars. And then they'll tell you, here's what it is. And, and God's really setting up Samuel. This is the tease before the really crazy thing that he's going to ask uh, Samuel to do. But before we go to that, we're going to do a little Bible trivia here. And it's just a very simple yes or no answer. I'm going to ask the question, and then I want you to say out loud just immediately. You don't even think about it. Just say whatever you think it is going to be. Ready? Does God... In his presence and in his love for us, whenever he communicates with us, does he ever give us an easy assignment? The Bible is our guide. When he came to Noah and he said, hey, build an ark in the middle of the desert. Everyone's going to think you're crazy for decades. And there's no rain, but it's going to rain. There's going to be a flood. Was that an easy or hard assignment? That was a hard one. When he came to Jonah and said, hey, look, I want you to go over to Nineveh. I know those people are crazy and they skin people alive and they're pretty dangerous and brutal and awful. Go and tell them they're wrong and that they need to come and follow me. Was that easy or hard? When he came to Mary and said, you're pregnant. I know you're a virgin, but there's this Holy Spirit thing that happened and you're going to raise the Son of God. Easy or hard? Hard. It's never easy. It's always difficult. And what God had to say to Eli was not good. If you have your Bibles, you can read the next several verses, verses 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16. I'll summarize it for you here pretty quickly. He basically said, Eli is not honoring me. By the way, Eli was his mentor, had become basically like his family. That's who he looked up to and was looking after him. And he said, your mentor, the person that you've been following and you've been, you know, has been caring for you, he's done it all wrong. He didn't, he didn't, uh, he didn't call out his kids, the kids have made the uh, temple of God a complete mess. They're like ripping people off for forgiveness of sin. They're eating the food when they're not supposed to. They're they're doing all these different things. And so you need to tell them that it's basically over and you're going to be the new leader. Can you imagine? You hear from the Lord for the first time and then you got to tell your mentor, hey, your whole life's a mess. And you're not going to be able to do this and so on and so on. So we fast forward to verse 17. Here we go. This is really wild. What is it that he said to you, Eli asked Samuel? (laughs) Do not hide it from me. I believe he said that. You can study it on your own. Scholars have different thoughts. I think he knew it was coming. And I'll I'll tell you that with the the next couple verses. But I think he knew like, this is kind of my reckoning day. I'm going to have to deal with this. So he said, do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely. If you hide from me anything that he told you, like don't soft pedal this one. I need to know. So Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. Then Eli said, this is why I think he knew it was coming. He said, he's the Lord, let him do what is good in his eyes. I have messed up and there are consequences. And this is what it's going to have to be. The Lord was with Samuel from that moment on as he grew up. And he let none of Samuel's words fall to the ground. In other words, Samuel was committed to him and was listening and hearing what God would say, and then he would speak what God was communicating to him. He would live out what God was asking him to live out. And as a result, incredible things happen. So we spent a little bit of time talking about this wonderful story of Samuel and Eli. And I want to give you a couple of just key little nuggets of what we can learn from this practical application. Then we're going to spend the rest of our time in complete practical application. But here's a couple of things that I want to just throw out before we go on. Don't Ask God to speak if you don't want to hear what he has to say. I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes, less than that, about 15 minutes, teaching you and teaching myself, because I'm terrible at this, uh, learning how to hear the voice of God. But I'm going to tell you before we do this, don't ask him to speak if you don't want to hear what he has to say. The second learning is, Prayer is a lot more about listening than it is about talking. 
Prayer is way, way more, in my opinion and in my life. So maybe you're really good at this. I don't want to offend you. But for me, I talk way too much. And I need to listen a whole lot more. So how do I learn to hear God's voice? The first thing is simply this. Be still. Be still and know that I am God. Psalm chapter 46, verse 10. Raise your hand if you feel like you lead a pretty hectic life. Just go ahead and raise your hand. You got a lot of things going on, moving. Yeah, all these, we're, we're always going. We're always doing. We're always doing. Things. How many of you look at your, have you ever noticed your weekly report on your phone? Do you have that on your phone? Like it shows you how many hours you spend? Now, I have to cast my White Sox games onto the TV um, because of, that's how I got to do it right now because my cable thing's all messed up. Uh, but last week I spent five, over five hours on my phone a day. Now, two or three, that's the White Sox game. That's still a lot of time. There's still a lot of busyness. There's still a lot of things going on. Do you think it'd be appropriate for someone to come up and say, slow down? When's the last time you sat still for more than five minutes without doing anything? Just sit still. No TV, no screen, just calm. I was reading the scripture this week, and this is not in the notes. Uh, I just kind of was putting in some extra things last night as I was going over the message. And 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 35 really, really spoke to me. It said, I want you to live in the right way, to give yourselves fully to the Lord. And this last part just really got me without concern for other things. I want to say that again. I'm going to have you repeat it because it really meant something to me. I hope it means something to you, okay? I'll say it, you repeat it, okay? I want you to live in the right way. You say that. I want you to live in the right way. Now, say it again. To give yourself fully to the Lord. Say that with me. To give yourself fully to the Lord. Last one, without concern for other things. Go ahead. Man, wouldn't that be something? We could hear from God if we live that out. Now, here's the ways that God speaks to us. Number one, he speaks to us through his word. In my opinion, it's the most important and reliable. His word is living and active. And oh, by the way, it's available at all times. All you gotta do is look at it. All you gotta do is read it. God's word will speak to you in wrongdoing in your own life. God's word will speak to you for comfort. God's word will speak to you to guide you. If you haven't heard from God, this may be a little bit of a strong statement, you probably haven't spent enough time in his word. Because those are his words to you. And it's the answer for any situation you are facing. Uh, on my phone, I have this thing called the YouVersion app. Would highly encourage you to download it. It's free. It's got all these different Bible studies on it. I was doing a discipleship with another guy. And I said, hey, listen, we need God's word in our life. He's like, yeah, I really need, I don't know how to do it. How do we do it? I said, let's do this app thing and we'll just download a 365 day, you know, read, you know, just a, a scripture a day with a thought and a prayer and a devotion. And then like, you can be my friend and I'll be your friend. We'll connect through that. And then we can like hold one another accountable. It's been wonderful. We're 50 days in. By the way, you don't have to start a 365 day, you know, in the Bible thing in January 1st. And if you miss it, you're done, right? You can do it anytime. And so we start this thing, and in the morning, he, it's like a, te it's a contest. Who can do it first, you know? And then he's like, man, this is so applicable to my life. It's only one or two verses. It's uncanny how relevant the Bible is. For me, the majority of the way that I hear from God is through his word. And I want to encourage you with all that I can to set up some sort of a Bible reading plan, some sort of a devotion so that you can hear from God Every single day. God speaks through his word. God speaks through people. God, th God speaks through people. Oftentimes he speaks through godly people. Uh, we are in a unique situation as a church. We have 100 people that are ready to go to launch a location in Seneca, which is 30 miles west of here. We're really excited about that. We have a wonderful team put together and they're so excited to reach into that community. It's really an awesome thing. We had a contract all set up with a, with a church over there. And about four weeks ago, that contract was um, nullified. And the, the church said, hey, we just, we can't do it. 
We know we said we were going to, but we can't do it. And so we were kind of in a panic mode because our goal date was uh, September 20th. We had less than five weeks to figure this out. I was sitting down in the office with our, with our team and I was like, ah, I don't know what we're going to do. What are we going to do? And Nick uh, Sanino is also one of our teaching, he is our teaching pastor. Um, he said, don't worry, it's okay. We've been down this road before. Remember 84 Lumber? For those of you who are part, not a part of our church, we purchased, we had under contract the lumber company. We were going to move into it and there's all this space and all this great stuff. We spent nine months through that process only to have the rezoning denied by our local municipality. They're good people. But we really appreciate them. They made a decision that was best for the village and I get it. We understood it at the time, but that was really hard. Then we had another piece of property that we thought, oh, this is going to work and we were, everything was great. And the people that said they were going to sell it to us decided, no, we're just not going to sell it to you. And that's six months later. That didn't work out. And then we found this property that I'm speaking to you from today. And we were supposed to be in in February, but some construction delays and some other delays and all these different things. Five months later in May, we got in on Memorial Day and it all worked out. And Nick's words to me were just like, it's okay. We might have a pause or a delay here, but it's going to work out. God's good. We're going to be fine. I needed to hear that in that moment. So it's funny how God works. Three weeks pass, and we tried three more new locations, locations, and all three said no. And I was, you know, declaring to, okay, here's where we're at. You know, we're really kind of uh, at a loss. We don't know what to do. And Nick was getting upset. And he was, well, what are we going to do? And I said, wait a minute. Remember 84 Lumber? <laughs> Remember the land? Remember the, you know, getting in here? And he was like, oh, that's really good. That's, that's good words of wisdom. Thanks for saying that. I said, I didn't say it. You did three weeks ago, right? God speaks through his people, and oftentimes we don't realize it. The moral of the story is, are you around godly people? Are you around people that can speak into your life and say the things that need to be said? We're in this middle of a season of life groups and getting everybody together in smaller groups, 8 to 10, 12 people. And I know we're in a season of virus, and I know we need to be careful. And we can do that. You can do that. You can join via video. You can wear a mask. You can socially distance. You can do all those things. Don't let those obstacles become an excuse to misconnecting with God's people. Because when we cut ourselves off from each other, Satan wins. God speaks through people. And we need to be surrounded by good people. God speaks through circumstances. Did you know that? He speaks through circumstances. Let's talk about the virus for a little bit. That has been a, a, a unique challenge for us to move everything online and then be back and socially distance and RSVP and all these different things. It's a lot of extra time. It's a lot of extra energy. It's a lot of extra work. And man, has it been fruitful. One of our key things that we do in the life of the church is we have a 10-week intensive discipleship process where we want to just pour into people everything that we possibly can about following Jesus so that if they are unaware, uncertain of how to do that, they will know. And they can live it for the rest of their life. You know, you teach a, you know, you give somebody a fish and they can eat for a day. You teach a person to fish, they can, you know, the rest of their life, that's the goal. And the way that we've done Rooted prior to COVID is all together in one space. We'd have kids that would have, we'd have childcare available. We'd break into our groups and we would only do it once in the fall, once in the spring, and a pretty limited group in the summer. So in March, we were in the middle of our spring rooted session. COVID hits. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And we're trying to figure out digital church and all these different things. And in the midst of that, there were some key leaders who set up and said, hey, wait a minute. Everybody's on Zoom right now. Why don't we launch more rooted sessions online? People have time. People have space. They can be at home. Sure. So instead of having one session in the fall, we added three more. And we did them all via Zoom. It was really quite fascinating as I'm going on the Zoom call, because the teaching pastor, either Nick or I, uh, will be talking to the team uh, weeks 1, 8, and 10, and really leaning in with them. As we're doing that, I'm on the Zoom call, and I'm looking at the Zoom, and I'm like, I don't know, but just two people of the 15 people that are on the Zoom call. And I'm introducing myself. I've never seen you before. What's your name? I'm Nate. Good to meet you. How did you hear about us? Well, the guy I was working with invited me to be a part of this. I don't live anywhere close to you. This is my 
myself, and then I invited my mom, and she's here, and this is a really great thing. And it was just unbelievable to see how God can, even in the midst of difficult circumstances, do his work. God's always at work. God's always at work. The final thing is that God speaks through his spirit. God's spirit interacts with our spirit. And I'm learning more and more about this. I've got a long way to go. But what I'm learning is, there's times where I just kind of feel these promptings, right? It's just this, somebody's on my mind. Somebody's on my heart. And I'm learning that whenever that happens over and over again, I need to call those people. Hey, it's Nate. How are you doing? And nine times out of ten, I'm so glad you called. I've been really going through a hard time. That's God working in our spirits. If you have a prompting, if you have like this sense and a feeling, someone's in trouble or somebody needs help, you call. I've also learned that oftentimes just regular interactions are really quite remarkable. Um, this week, I just have just started to do this. Anytime I call somebody or interact with somebody, the first question I generally ask is, how are you doing? And if they give me the quick, I'm doing fine, I'm like, no, really, how are you doing? And oftentimes it's like, you know, I'm having a really bad day having a really bad week, having a really bad month. What's going on? We can begin to talk and we can begin to interact. I can begin to help minister to that particular person. God speaks through his word. He speaks through his people. He speaks through circumstances. And he speaks through his spirit. So we got to be still. We got to quiet down. We got to slow down so that we can hear him. And then be able to act. We've got to be quiet. We've got to be willing to do what he's called us to do. Because he's going to speak. If we start to open ourselves up to those four ways that he speaks to us, he's going to, he's going to start to work. One of my favorite verses learned as a kid was, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not all in your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. Let me say that scripture again. But the second verse I'm going to say, which is on the screen right now. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Seek his will in all you do, and he will show you which path to take. Are you seeking his will? Are you taking four minutes, five minutes, ten minutes to just be quiet and listen? Our series title is What's in It for Me. It's kind of a play on words because that's often how we think. What's in it for me? What is going to benefit me? And what we're trying to do is saying in the, in the attitude of prayer and in the ways that we do things, we should probably say a different thing or we should probably have, certainly have a different attitude. It's like, what is it, God, that you want to do in and through me? And how can I unselfishly come before you and ask you to work in and through my life? Maybe instead of prayers like, God, fix this, fix this, fix this, do this, give me more money, more da 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 Maybe we should say prayers like this. God, show me my sins. Show me the motives behind my sins. Help me to deal with this dark stuff inside of me so I can be all that you want me to be. God, help me to love my husband who is far away from you. God, help me to use my gifts in your church to help other people. Give me opportunities to do that. We had a great uh, leadership team meeting last week. One of the gentlemen in the room was talking about leading a men's group. And he said, now from this point on, if anything happens, I get an opportunity. I'm just going to say yes. I don't know what I'm going to be able to do. I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm just going to say yes and see what God is going to do in and through me. We've got to be willing. We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. We've got to be ready. Because here's the thing I've learned about the Lord. Whenever he speaks and we listen, it's time to go. It's time to move. So once we get this figured out, we slow down and we really are able to hear, he's going to give us things to do. He's going to challenge us in our heart and in our mind. Every single one of us are going to feel unprepared, unequipped, unqualified. And there's a good chance it's going to be intimidating, scary, impossible. It's going to take some faith. And that's exactly where we need to be. Because we're reminded of, remember the video, whose hands we're in? A football is just a football in my hands. A basketball is just a basketball in my hands. A golf club is just a golf club. But my life in the hands of God and him communicating to me 
and to you. He can do great things. So the band's going to come out now, and we've set this whole thing up so that you can have some time to just process. And I want you to, in this time of processing as they're coming out, I want you to pray the same, uh, I want you to say the same thing that Samuel said, and I want you to open yourself up through this next song to where God might work in and through you. So I'm going to say the words, and you're going to repeat it. Okay, ready? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Say that with me. Ready? Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Say it again. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Say it again. Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Let's pray. Lord, I want to ask that you would help us to quiet out any concern, anything that's entering our mind right now, and just put it aside. Just put it out of our mind. Help us to be quiet before you. Speak. Speak into our lives through your words, through people, through circumstances, through your spirit, speak. We're going to listen. We're going to shut our mouths. And we're going to shut out the world. And we're going to listen. you got a lot to say. We can't wait to hear from you.